Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to answer a subscriber's question in response to the Silicon Valley bank video that I did last week. Um, so Joss Deep, apologize if I mispronounced that here, um, has made all kinds of comments on the channel, uh, but they're basically asking, you know, uh, SVB already had a very high exposure to tech startups and they were all starting to withdraw from this bank, so from SVB originally, assuming that they had hedged a large part of interest rate risk, won't the forced liquidation of these startups still cause the bank to fail? Um, so I'll address this first and I'll address the second part of this question here. Yes and no. So it depends on how the bank was managing the risk. So risk in itself, so any institution in itself, everybody has risk. So, you know, you leaving your house today is a risk. You staying in your house is a risk, right? What if a tornado comes by and hits your house and you die? Uh, what if you walk out the door and a drive-by shooting happens and they shoot and kill you? Um, what if like you walk out and you get in your car and somebody slams into you and kills you in your car? Like these are all risks. And I think this is what we are not seeing in risk management both in the banking side, uh, the public definitely is not seeing this. Uh, everything we do is a risk, right? But we can't just live under rocks and pretend like, you know, we're going to put safety bumpers on everything. We're not going to drive our cars. We're not going to travel. Uh, we still have to go gather food. We still need shelter. We still need companionship with other people. So life is risky. We have to, you know, figure out which risks we want to avoid and which ones we want to take, right? You might not decide to go skydiving every weekend because maybe you're risk adverse and you could basically prevent, you know, any chance of an accident happening during skydiving by just not skydiving. Um, so risk really has kind of three approaches that we have in the industry. Uh, one is you just accept the risk. So the risk exists, we accept it. Uh, one of the knee jerk reactions I'm seeing with SVB, which of course they made the wrong decisions here and, that's a whole other thing. Um, but often you can choose to accept the risk and say, okay, this risk exists. We don't think the probability is very high. We think the cost of hedging that risk is too high. So therefore we are not going to actually do anything. We're just gonna accept it. Okay, the second one is going to be, you can actually hedge that risk. So you could say, you know, this is an activity we want to take. So for example, any bank that ever exists, any corporation, anything alive has to take on risk. And often you are just going to manage the risk. So you're gonna make some sort of action to manage that. Uh, banks, for example, instead of just making loans to everybody under the sun and not caring if you go bankrupt or not, they're really concerned about losing money and going bankrupt. So what they do is they create risk models. And we use these models to help manage risk in the way that we issue loans here. So strategically, we can manage our risk in this way that we actually issue loans. So how we pick customers, um, different industries we do and don't want to get involved in. For example, many banks have avoided the cannabis industry because it might be legal in your state or that state that they're making the loan in, but federally it's not legal. It's a gray area. And so, you know, banks have kind of avoided these specific areas because again, it's a risk. In this case, they're just avoiding it and not getting involved. Um, but you can manage these sorts of risks like in loans and you can just create models and, you know, you can buy hedges, for example, as well, which is another way to manage your risk. You say, okay, I want to get involved in this activity. I only want to take 75% of this risk. I don't want the 100%. And financial engineering allows you to use derivative products to slice and dice, and you can basically pawn off that risk for a price to somebody else. So the first one's going to be accept the risk, do nothing. Uh, the second one is going to be accept the risk, but we're gonna actually do something to manage or hedge that. And the third one's going to be completely avoid the risk. Just don't get involved here. So in a banking, like, you know, environment here, you can think about this in three separate ways with this scenario. Uh, SVB, what they basically did is said, okay, we accept the risk. If anything bad happens, we don't really care. We're willing to accept that risk. Well, something bad happens, so they need to pay the piper for that. Uh, the second approach they could have taken, which I've seen people kind of discussing, they used to be hedging with this and hedging seems to be the number one goal here. Um, they could have just not hedged. They could have literally just purchased other assets to have returns that had a well-balanced position here. So uh, fixed income products, they bought long-term fixed income products here from government bonds, which seems super safe, but of course they ignored the whole fact uh, there's interest rate risk as interest rates go up, price of these assets go down. Um, they could have just bought, instead of fixed rates, they could have bought floating rates or they could have bought tips, which are uh, inflation protected products from the government. 
which would have been another option. They don't work as well, though. Uh, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, they could have, though, bought, again, the floating. They could have bought shorter durations. So why shorter duration helps get rid of this risk of the rates moving is because if you have a three-month bond, for example, let's say it's, I don't know, for $100,000, and it pays, you know, I don't know, three, like, I don't know, let's say 2% or something, uh, every three months, it runs out. So you have to re-roll that into another three-month product. Well, you only have exposure to that rate for three months because, you know, you're going to collect your, your payments, your coupon payments from the bond uh, for that three-month period. But then if rates go up uh, in the next period, you are going to be having an adjusted bond. So you will buy another three-month bond, but instead of 2%, it's like 25 And then if it keeps rolling over and rates keep rising, uh, you only have risk in a sense, in a short period. It's a three month period and it keeps rolling over for that. Now, when you buy like a 10 year bond or a 30 year or whatever, the problem is, is when you buy that, you lock in that rate from the beginning and now you're exposed to that rate risk of it going up for the entire duration of that, that asset, that bond here, right? Now, if you were to go in the other direction, let's say rates were really high and you bought this bond and it was like, I don't know, say a 10 year bond's paying like 30%, something crazy. Uh, when you have 30%, right, that's awesome. You want to lock that in because you realize rates probably aren't going to go anywhere near that high again. And so when that, you know, the rates come down, the price of that bond's going to go up and you would make money here. So again, they didn't have to take a hedged position. They didn't have to buy derivative products for this. They could have just purchased different assets um, to help kind of pay for overhead expenses I mentioned in the first video. And then the third position here too is they could have just said, we don't want to be involved in this. We don't want to take deposits and they could have just not been a bank. But that's really not an option, right? If you're going to be a bank, you have to take deposits. That's really how banking works. So those are the three decisions. That's the three types of risk with us. So going back to the question here, uh, they basically put, assuming that they had hedged a large part of interest rate risk, won't the forced liquidation of these startups cause the bank to fail? So this is touching on a completely different point, which is what I avoided in the first video, because now we're getting into business and running businesses here. And let me read the second part of the question as well, so I can address this all together. Um, they put, I mean, very high exposure to a single industry could have also been enough for the bank run. Uh, what do you think? I believe all banks and large funds have huge unrealized losses, right? Um, so yeah, what I talked about in the first video, what a lot of people are talking about is the run on the banks. So people that put deposits in are coming back for the deposits. This looks really rosy from a regulator standpoint of like, it reminds us of like the 1930s, like the run on the banks, the government stepped in, they made everybody whole, they, you know, sailed off into the sunset and government saved everybody. Um, what you're getting at now, which I kind of alluded to in that video is like, I would have to pull apart their financials and look at a bunch of other things to see what other sketchy things are going on behind the scenes. And what you're getting at is correct. Uh, if they were to make a bunch of loans, so you think about a bank here, we've talked about deposits. They took a bunch of deposits from a bunch of startups and a bunch of people that were in the tech industry. And then they took those deposits and hypothetically they went out and they, you know, had a bunch of long, uh, bonds here, essentially government bonds to bring in cash, to cover the overheads, to hold the deposits. But what we didn't talk about is the fact that a lot of those deposits are going to be then lent out into loans to other businesses like venture capital and startups and angel investing and, and all that jazz. And I believe from reading a lot of things online, they were heavily involved in the tech industry. And because of that, yes, if they had a bunch of loans, so imagine you take, I don't know, for simplicity's sake, you take $100 in in deposits and let's say you're super safe and you're only going to give out, I don't know, let's say 50 of it. So 50% of it, $50. Uh, you make a loan or a bunch of loans to a bunch of tech firms in the form of $50. If all these firms default, so all these tech firms are blowing up, they're not going to pay that money back. Now you don't have the money to cover the position to pay back the deposits. And so now when you have a run on the bank as well, that's also going to exacerbate the problem here. But this then gets deeper into risk management practices of credit models. So did you have um, credit models in place? Everyone's required to do CECL, which is the current expected credit loss, uh, is what CECL stands for, C-E-C-L. And in part of CECL, we have to model out and recognize all of the expected losses for those loans as of today. So I don't know in the nitty gritties of this, but they're going to be specialized in one specific area um, and that industry starts to blow up. Of course, that's an excessive risk here. Now, that being said, I think it's critical to look at this from a business perspective. So let's step back from banking here, right? Let's just look at businesses. Every business is going to have some sort of risk, okay? So let's, let's talk about Nike here. 
Nike started in 1964. And if my history is correct on this, um, Nike made running shoes. Okay. It's just a running shoe. They made a running shoe. That is a huge risk because the business is only making one product. But to run a business, you have a lot of risks. Okay. This is like any business. When you start a business, there is a risk that customers won't buy enough of your product. There is a risk that you cannot sell that product at a competitive price. So imagine, you know, all these other shoe manufacturers, if they are far more efficient than Nike and there's no edge for Nike in 1964, they would have went bankrupt, just like SVB is went bankrupt. So every firm has a risk in the sense that they're going to be very specialized in one area. Now, when you start to look at companies like Nike here as the example, of course, they have diversified and they're trying to keep up on the cutting edge. This is why they always have new shoes coming out with new colors and new patterns and new designs. It's not because like they're making a shoe that is 10 times better of a shoe. Um, Yeah, there are some advances in there. They have some really cool ones for like running marathons and they're all controversial now, but the reality is they keep making new products to stay relevant. Um, they've also diversified into, of course, all kinds of other things that are related to this industry. So sports and athletics, uh, like apparel, so shoe, uh, shorts, t-shirts. Um, I think they have like running bands that go like around your knees. They have, I mean, it's Nike. They make all kinds of crap. I think they even have like sports equipment and things like basketballs. And, you know, they've diversified out across the spectrum. They don't make one shoe anymore. They make a whole line of all kinds of crazy shoes and they have limited edition shoes and They've diversified their business. However, they're still in a specific sort of niche here. So in that question as well, you know, isn't this a risk in the fact they didn't diversify and it seems like a lot of funds have unrealized losses? Yes, everybody has unrealized losses in the sense that if this happens, so if A happens, uh, there could be bad results. So we talked about before that the last video, I mentioned a lot of banks specialize in a very specific niche or specific area. And even if you're not managing those risks, when we looked at the three types of risk here, where you either avoid it completely and don't get involved in the business, which isn't a case, uh, you can either manage the risk or you can accept the risk. Any risk that any bank is going to accept or any firm is going to accept, those sorts of risks could blow up your firm. It could blow up any business. So if Nike would have started in 1964 and somebody came out with, I don't know, a better shoe and a better product and, you know, they would have had vast diversification. They had all these things. The market changed and people stopped wearing shoes. Maybe they had to flip flops or something. Uh, So we're not wearing running shoes anymore. Right. These are all risks that you have to accept as part of the business here. And this is why in SVB, I'm highly critical in the way that they did their risk management practices, because it seems like a lot of things they could have done, which is why so many people are like, why did you take on the excessive amount of risk of long uh, term bonds where the rates obviously are going to be going up in the marketplace? Like we all kind of saw that coming. We've been at record lows. And now, you know, rates have gone up, prices of these bonds have gone down. Like this just seems like you just didn't manage the risk. Like this isn't even a business specific risk. Now on the flip side of this, this is why I have stated it's not the whole banking community going bankrupt and the world's going to end because SVB, I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but SVB doesn't hold a lot of assets with other banks. So where this plays into financial crises and the whole banking system collapsing in 2008 and all that the way that this has played out is different. When 2008 played out, a lot of large banks are all tied together. They share products here. So this goes into specialization. Uh, let's say a bank is really, really good at subprime auto loans. Okay. And I've worked in this industry for quite some time. We make a lot of subprime auto loans because that's what we're really, really good at. It's really easy to make money for us compared to other firms because that's our specialty. Now, our portfolio is going to be way too risky in the sense that it's just subprime and subprime is sketchier than sketchy. And so we need to do something about that, right? So to diversify, we often do securitizations, which is you issue a bunch of these loans out, you specialize in pricing them more accurately than anybody else. You have all the risk baked in and then you sell these products to other banks, Okay. Now, another bank, like in the last video on SVB, I mentioned, I mentioned Wells Fargo was the third largest mortgage uh, lender, at least at the time, and they're cutting back on their mortgage business. Now, beforehand, when they were the third largest lender, they specialized in making all these mortgages. So they create these mortgage products, they lend out the money to consumers, they have really, really good models in that scenario. And then other banks actually will buy, again, their securitized products 
um, as a way to diversify. So now that bank that has, you know, let's say it's a subprime auto company, they have no specialty in mortgages. They have no specialty in the prime markets. So what happens is they're able to go out to the other banks and buy all these products to help diversify their own portfolios. Now, this is pros and cons. If something blows up and one bank goes down, if you're holding too much of one asset and every bank holds the same asset, the banks that aren't diversified well are going to collapse together. So that's what was happening in 2008 is there was too many players connected. And so just to give you kind of the domino effect here, uh, let's say you had four main players that were, you know, way too invested in uh, subprime let's say just say mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, mortgage issues in general, and the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. The issue is, is then if those four players are like say top 10 banks and they go down, it's not just their mortgage position that tanks, their entire firm goes down. So now that firm, if they have auto loans, credit cards, savings, um, all these checking accounts that we're talking about here with SVB, if they go down, then all of a sudden, all of this money is at risk. So now they collapse, and then the second bank and the third bank and the fourth bank that were all way too heavily invested in mortgage-backed securities, if they all tank together, now every person that has a partnership with them in some some way or form is going to go down with them. And the way a lot of these commercial deals work as well is one bank never wants to have all the risk in a specific situation here. So let's say, I don't know, we'll go back to Nike here. Nike wants to build a new plant. They need, I don't know. $500 million to do this plant and they're going to build it in Dallas, Texas because we're the best. And so they want to build this giant plant here. And what ends up happening is one bank doesn't want to take all that risk and not have diversification. So smart banks, they go, they go, okay, I'm the lead bank. I'm the banker for Nike. Uh, I'm going to take, I don't know, say 25% of this. And they take 25% of the deal. And then they go out and they say, okay, we're going to find other banks who want to get in on this deal and we're gonna help them underwrite. So we take a fee because we're the bank that's putting the whole deal together. But we find other uh, banks to lend money to this project and then three, four, five, six, seven banks will all end up putting money in at different percentages um, so that we can spread the risk across the banks and everyone can manage their risks. So that's how it works. Now, as I mentioned, if banks start collapsing in their larger banks and they're tied together, now this creates kind of a domino effect when the banks are kind of tied together here. Well, SVB was like $212 billion in portfolio, which sounds like a lot. But when you look at the size of the 15 banks above them, especially the ones in the trillions at the top, it wasn't really that big of a bank. And because SVB was so isolated from the other banks and the way they were doing their business, or at least the way it looks when you read all the articles, um, that when they went down, they're not taking down the whole banking structure like Wells Fargo and Bank of America and JP Morgan. They're not going under because they aren't tied to SVB in that meaningful of a way here. So I think that's a key difference as well on the risk perspective here. Um, so to answer your question in full here, there are complexities to this. Every firm has to take on specific types of risks. SVB did not take on very strategic risks. It seems like they either didn't know they had the risks or I don't know. They just didn't realize that what was going on. I don't know. I, I don't really know what's inside their head. They don't like to speculate on who said what or thought whatever. Um, but again, yeah, every firm has risks they accept. Every firm has exposure. So those are unrealized losses that if the market happened to go a specific way, they would take on larger losses here. Um, SVB, again, they could have done things better. It's a very specific case here. No, I don't think it would have collapsed the entire financial markets. Uh, even when like the government started throwing in articles, like the media is posting about, you know, Signature Bank went under and this crypto bank went under. I'm like, so were they a depositor in SVB? Or like, how is that tied together? Because it doesn't seem like it's a network of banks going down. It seems like you had just, Signature Bank, who went belly up, uh, and then SVB is going belly up, but it seems like for two different reasons here. And then crypto things, I mean, it's crypto. Like, it's just sketchy as it is. So anyways, those are my two cents. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.